The most interesting things that I've ever experienced have also been the worst. My experience of falling so deeply in love with somebody over many years who was my best friend and then having that person return to active drug addiction and become the most dangerous person I have ever been around. It's also just like, wow, this is really interesting. I didn't know my story was going to go this way. I think every woman I know could write a memoir with the title, not exactly what I planned. Welcome, I'm Alyssa Nobriga, your host of the Healing and Human Potential podcast, a place for you to discover the multidimensionality of what it means to be human. Over the past 20 years, I've trained thousands of coaches in my methodology, leveraging my experience as a former psychotherapist, and I'm here to share with you all the wisdom and insights that I've learned along the way. Each week, I'll share with you life-changing tools to support you in awakening and manifesting your dream life from the inside out. We'll be exploring the intersection between ancient wisdom and modern everyday life, really diving deep into the art of human potential through the lens of psychology, spirituality, and coaching. Let's let the magic unfold. I am so excited for today's guest. We have the incredible Elizabeth Gilbert on the Healing Human Potential podcast today. She's an international best-selling author who has had several New York Times bestsellers, including Eat, Pray, Love, Committed, City Girls, and Big Magic. She is a phenomenal speaker and Times Magazine has nominated her one of the top 100 most influential people in the world. We recently vacationed together in Costa Rica at a friend's home, and she is literally one of the warmest and silliest humans that I've ever met. I think everybody loves her because she's so real, she's vulnerable, she's wise, but super relatable. The fact that Julia Roberts plays her in her movie is perfect because everyone loves Julia, but everyone also loves Lizzie. And so today we're going to talk about the magic of creativity and how to tap into that well that lives inside of all of us. Yay! I'm so happy that you're here. And I, I love that I get to share your magic with my community. I already know that they love and know you. I mean, everybody loves and knows you. And it's such a gift to have you here. I, I was reflecting on our recent trip, uh, staying at a friend's house in Costa Rica and this beautiful creativity workshop that you led us through. And the simplicity, but the power in it. And for those that are listening and know my certification program, it's somewhat similar to the Love Fear Dialogue. Would you share with us a little bit about that workshop and that where the inspiration came from too? Yeah. First of all, hi. hi. It's so nice to see you. Last time I saw you, we were literally rolling in the surf. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like little kids <laughs> in the ocean. Lizzie, you have such a beautiful way to remind people to play just by not taking yourself too seriously. It's really beautiful. It was extreme. We were, you know, just getting knocked around by waves and playing tag, and it was so fun. Um, so, so the creativity workshop that I teach grew out of my book Big Magic, and my book Big Magic grew out of my TED talk about creativity, and my TED talk about creativity <laughs> grew out of like decades of being a creative person and just um, having to grapple again and again and again with fear mm -hmm. and also being a really fearful person. I'm a really creative person and I'm also a really fearful person. Mm -hmm. And I always say that my like one saving grace is that I'm like 1% more curious than I am frightened, mm -hmm. but I'm extremely frightened, you know, but I'm just like 1% more curious, which is all you need to just tip the scale a little bit to push you to do the frightening thing. Mm -hmm. And um, so I created this workshop that is about taking people on a kind of emotional journey through a series of letters that they write to themselves. And it's all the same stuff I do when I'm in my creative process, mm -hmm. starting with a letter that you write to yourself from your fear, where um, your fear is allowed to speak without being judged or interrupted about what it's frightened of. And then we move from that to a letter to yourself from your sense of enchantment about what it, you know, just where the magic is and what it longs for. And then there's a permission slip that you write to yourself from the principal's office, super giving yourself fun. <laughs> super fun and empowering. And then there's a letter about trust where you, you write essentially an amends to yourself for all the times that you have um, betrayed your own self and your, your, and self-abandoned. And then the last one is a letter from unconditional love, um, which is really the divinity of the whole experience where mm -hmm. you circle back and you find that fear and then you write to it from a place of unconditional love. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And, and that's something I do every day. So every single day when I wake up, I write myself a letter from unconditional love. And I just love introducing people to these, to these really super simple practices that um, keep me out of my, keep me out of my deepest despair and terror. I still have to feel despair and terror, mm -hmm. but I don't have to feel it so in such a um, debilitating way. Yeah. And it's such a practice that we were just sharing before starting on the podcast, just to come back to our hearts and not just live from the, the mind, because we can oftentimes think about our feelings as a sort of way to avoid feeling them. And just to the practice of allowing the feelings to come up, you don't even need to do anything with them. And to be presence with love is so profound. It's so healing. And I think there's a direct correlation with working with our unconscious material and giving us more creative expression. So I don't even know if you're aware of that, but 100% as we do the shadow work, it opens for more vitality, creativity. And I love this process. It was really such a beautiful uh, workshop. I'm going to read my letter from Unconditional yeah. Love because yeah. I loved how you demonstrated, like for one, your vulnerability and your rawness it's so relatable. And it also just sets the tone for well, what would it sound like? Because when I started talking to myself from a really loving place, it sounded like a cheerleader. I was like, you don't need to feel this way. And that's not what love really sounds like. And the more that we learn, learn how to do that with ourselves, the better parents we are, the better we are to ourselves to our people we work with, and it just ripples out. So, you know, love kind of energetically gets on her knees or their knees and meets you exactly as you are instead of, and just says, tell me more. So I'll read mine. Um, Hi, sweetheart. I love you so much. And this came from this experience with Liz. I'm sorry that you're hurting. I'm here. I'll be with you when you're scared. You don't need to be any different than the way that you are. It's a totally okay to want to be seen, to feel special. It's so human. You thinking that you could waste your life is just a story appearing in this moment. Your fears are welcome with me. Tell me more. These fears are here to help wake you up from the nightmare that you're creating in your mind. Wanting more makes you come alive. Enjoy it. Just use it as a reminder to also notice what you have. As you meet this moment, you realize you already have what you want. You already are what you want. I'll always be here to remind you of what's true. Never judge you, but welcome all judgments because I know I only hurt when my heart closes. I am your already always open heart waiting for you to notice. The judgment, the closed heart is all welcome and okay. All is well, all is welcomed. <laughs> oh, it's so beautiful. Can I share what I, what really stood out for me? Yeah, in that? please. Um, this could there be a more loving thing that you could be told than that it is not possible for you to waste your life yeah um i i really resonate with that i spoke with you when we were in person together and i talk a lot about how um debilitated i think so many of us have become in western culture by the grinding sense that we must have a higher purpose yeah. and that we must earn our right to be here through incredible achievement mm -hmm. and through finding like that one thing that you're supposed to be doing that only you can do and doing it better than anybody else and then monetizing it. And then, and if you do, and, and then leaving the world a better place, each one of us <laughs> is apparently supposed to change the world into a better place, which to me just sounds chaotic because it's like, there's 8 billion of us. So 8, 8 billion of us are supposed to change the world. Like, does anyone accept the world as it is? Or <laughs> yeah. are we all just here to change it? Right? Like it's so, it's such a violent theology mm -hmm. um, that insists on imposing yourself and your will and your vision into the world. And if you're not doing that, you've failed or you've wasted your life. And I, I know that I have certainly had experience with the feeling that I have wasted my life, that I have lost my path, that, that I have felt gone in the wrong direction, made all the wrong choices, like all those years I lost in this situation or all those years I lost in this relationship or mm -hmm. I, all these wrong moves that I made. And so it does something to my heart to hear your love say to you, it's just a story that you're telling that isn't true. You can't possible. do this wrong. Yeah. You can't 
do this living wrong. Yeah. And it's just so generous along with the openness and the allowing that all the feelings get to be there and the judges get judgments get to be there and the doubt gets to be there. Yeah. Um, I mean, what would love do except welcome everything? Exactly. Yeah. Because even if I judge judgment, that's another layer of judgment. And so <laughs> just open arms and truly everything's looking to be met with love. And even your workshop addressed this sense, and I won't spoil it for people that are going to do it. It addressed this sense of what should I do with my life? Right. But it comes from a totally different direction through surrender. So I'll let people be surprised by that. And when we were in the workshop, um, and this was for people at the house, you wove in some partner exercises. And I'm sitting next to Byron Katie, and she looks at me, and she's like, do you want a partner? I'm like, yes, I want a partner with you, Byron Katie. (laughs) For those that go... that wild? (laughs) Um, And the fact that she did the workshop, I mean, that's a true spirit... She's a spiritual master, and she was like, yeah, I'll take your workshop. Let's see what it is. I know. Open Open mind. For those that don't know Byron Katie, she, I would say, is an enlightened being. She, she would not say that. She's delightful. She is one of my favorite humans. You will experience her on the podcast. But she was reading me her list of enchantments. And one of the things I heard her say was, I love being no one. And hearing her say that softened a deep existential fear inside. It's like the ego holds on for the illusion of control, for the illusion of itself, for, you know, for survival purposes and hearing where it came from, this really genuine integrated place softened something in me to the point where everyone else is still finishing their partner exercise. And we went into a small inquiry around the illusion of time. And I end up just my mind stopped and I cried from such a deep place inside me. And then I just laid vertical for about an hour. So I missed the permission slip and the trust, which are two very important ones that I do. I did the, I went back to do the, um, the letter from the principal's office, this like permission slip that you do, which I was so powerful to take my power back from it. I totally skipped the trust one, which I need to go back to do now. And I, I appreciate just how integrated the whole thing was between being playful and light and deep and loving you kind of hit all the aspects and elements of it. And I also just appreciate how open you are about your own fears. And I'm curious because I heard that you wrote Big Magic specifically for creative beings that were facing fear. And I'm curious what your relationship and dance with fear has been as your career has evolved. So because you're playing a bigger game, do you have more fear or have you learned to dance with fear better or, or both? Oh, man, I never don't have fear. You know, um, I mean, I, (laughs) two mornings ago, I'm 300 pages into a memoir right now that I'm writing about addiction. I'm writing about my partner, Rhea's drug addiction and her relapse at the end of her life. That was like one of the biggest nightmares I've ever been through. And I don't have to describe what that's like for anybody who's ever loved an active drug addict. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and I'm also writing about sex and love addiction, which I've been in recovery for, for the last six years in a 12 step program for that. And I woke up two days ago, 300 pages into this memoir. And I was like, no, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this. Like, I'm not doing this to myself. I'm not, why am I, why am I doing this? Like, this is, I think the, the, the really deep fear that always comes up with creativity is like, why am I doing this? Why am I working so hard? Mm-hmm. Why am I working this hard? I'm at a point in my life where I don't need to work this hard. Mm-hmm. Why am I working this hard? I'm at a point in my life where I don't need to put myself through this much pain and discomfort. Why am I putting myself through this much pain and discomfort? Why am I exposing myself this way um, in this memoir? Why am I exposing my partner who's been dead for six years, who doesn't have a voice? Like, Do I have the ethical right to do this? Why am I opening myself up to what her loved ones might say about this when this book is published? Why am I opening myself up to public criticism? Why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. You know, like, fuck, I don't want to do this. I could just be swimming in the ocean. (laughs) Like, why am I doing this? And, and here's what I'm better at. I'm better at this voice that arises. That's like, this is your 11th book. And you have never not hit this point. Mm -hmm. You have never not hit this point where you're Mm. like, fuck this. Like, this is too hard. 
I'm going to be too attacked for it. Mm -hmm. People are going to have feelings that are too, into, I'm exposing myself. I'm too vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Why do we even, why does this even have to be made? Why does the world need to know this story? Everyone's already read about addiction, like whatever the thing is, but I can count back mm -hmm. to all 11 of those books and be like, remember how you felt this way about Eat, Pray, Love? Remember how <laughs> you felt this way about Big Magic? Remember how you felt this way about the signature of all things? Like, and, and I think really the bottom line answer to those questions is because, why am I doing this? Because, because, because something is calling me to do it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what the outcome is going to be for it. I don't know whether I will later say it ruined my life to write this, but I have no idea. It's none of my business. In the end, it's really none of my business why I create. Mm -hmm. um, and the less I'm involved intellectually with trying to figure out why I'm doing this, the better it is for everybody. <laughs> and, and I have a strong two-way prayer practice where every day I ask God for guidance and every day for the last year, God has been saying, yeah, this is what I want you to be doing. I know you don't want to do it, um, but this is what I want you to be doing. So stop asking questions and <laughs> put aside an hour today and write for an hour, and then you can go play with your friends. <laughs> you know, and so, so there's a discipline in it, which is to surrender to doing something without knowing. Mm -hmm. Can you do something without knowing why you're doing it? Can you do something without knowing whether it will be successful or a disaster? You know, like, the first thing I said to you when we started this podcast and you were like, are you ready? I was like, I'm ready. I have no preparation and I have no cherished outcome. Like that's doing without knowing. I don't, you know, I just said yes, because I like you. And because we had so much fun splashing around in the ocean together. And <laughs> you know, like, I don't know why we're doing this. Um, I don't know why we bother mm -hmm. on, on a nice day when we could be outside to be having this conversation, but I just do what I'm told. I'm pointing up to the sky right now, but I just do what I'm told. <laughs> By some sort of force that tells me what to do. And that's why we're here. And I have no idea what any of it means. <laughs> Part of it sounds like it's honoring a calling and not questioning it. And the other part sounds like by doing this over and over, this is your 11th book, you said. Yeah. And then it's like, you're, you're catching up to the patterns of fear so that you don't, cause it can be so convincing and so paralyzing sometimes but the more you've said yes and honored what the calling is and your the feedback, which I'm also curious about what, how that looks for you, but I'm hearing that you are no longer taking the mind so seriously and you're still moving forward to honor the calling and let go of the result. So like surrender yeah. action. Mm -hmm. No cherished outcome. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and if we just begin with the assumption that we have no idea what's going on here, mm -hmm. um, like, I literally don't know whether you and I are real or if I am AI dreaming you. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I literally have no idea what consciousness is. And guess who else doesn't know? No one. That's you right. know what I mean? Like, nobody knows what's going on here. Like, yeah. nobody knows what's going on here. So, and and people claim to know, but those people seem the least legitimate of all, you know, and <laughs> are your friend and mine, Byron Katie, is always very clear that there's no higher wisdom than the don't know mind. Yeah. So, so, so that's a really big way for me to address fear. Mm -hmm. Like, cause my fear always thinks it knows, oh, like it certainly. thinks it knows something. It thinks it knows it predicts doom. It, it like looks for doom patterns. It looks for like, mm -hmm. well, you did this once before and it was a disaster it's, it's very sure of itself, mm -hmm. you know, um, and that's a weird thing for it to be because it's also so weak and tremulous, but I guess that's just my ego. My ego is frightened and sure of itself. And I think the reason it's frightened is because it's sure of itself. Yeah. So if I can introduce true wisdom into the equation and just say, as I've heard what I call God say to me many times in my life, sweetheart, you don't even know what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. Like, how can you know what's going on when you don't even know what you're looking at? So might as well just write a book. <laughs> <laughs> that brings you joy. That's on your channel list. Why not? Yeah. Do you want new tools and powerful group exercises to help you deeply and profoundly change your life? Maybe you feel overwhelmed with the idea of starting or scaling your business and wish you had the strategy, the community, and the support to really help you shortcut the learning curve. If so, I wanna make sure that you know that our most popular event of the year is back by demand and it's absolutely free. So this is my five-day confidence and clients bootcamp and it's coming up for new and seasoned coaches 
coaches, therapists, and healers, but it's also for anybody that's wanting to up-level themselves from the inside out and really start the year off strong. So each day I'm gonna lead you through a live transformational group process. I'm gonna share with you behind the scenes coaching demos, pulling people up to coach. And I'll give you daily prizes and tools that you can use on yourself and with your clients right away. So you're gonna discover the real reason people don't create change so that you can more easily step into your goals. I'll show you how you can create the income that you desire and practical strategies for where to create clients today for free, as well as heart-centered sales. You can fall in love with sales with this approach. And I'm gonna teach you my manifestation packs as well so that you have everything that you need to embody a deeper sense of confidence. And then lastly, I will share with you not only tell you but also show you the power of embodiment work so that you can specifically use it to transform your relationship with money and attract real abundance so that you're really set up to scale with ease in all the ways that you're called to. I cannot wait to share this with you. Again, it's absolutely free, it's transformational, and it's gonna be so good. And research shows that we grow so much faster in community, so send this to a friend that you wanna do this with and help hold yourself accountable. Again, it's free. So join us before it's too late. All you have to do is go to alissanobriga.com forward slash bootcamp and reserve Reserve your space now. <laughs> and I read in Letters from Love, which is one of your uh, offerings, which is, you want to share a little bit about what that is, and then I'll share my insight. On sure. It. Yeah. So there's this new form, form called Substack that a lot of writers have moved to in recent years, and that a lot of us are seeing as a possible substitution for social media because of how incredibly problematic social media has become. I, I think of social media as like a party drug that somebody gave me 10 years ago that was like, this is fun. Take some of this. And you're like, oh my God, this makes everything better. The party is so much more fun. you know. And then I woke up a decade later and like, I'm addicted to it. It's destroyed democracy. <laughs> it's ruining, like, it's like taking hours of my day. It's like stealing my metrics. It's like destroying women's self-esteem. It's making kids commit suicide. It's like, wait, this drug sucks. <laughs> like this I thought this was like really fun, but this is terrible. And a lot of us have that feeling. And, and yet it's also such a great way to be able to communicate mm -hmm. with vast numbers of people, um, in, on the internet. And so Substack has, is essentially it's a blog. Um, it's a newsletter blog. So people can sign up for my newsletter, my Substack newsletter. Um, and then there's like a very low, fee that you can pay to be to be able to read the newsletter and comment on it which keeps the trolls out um mm -hmm. so it's it's five dollars a month or fifty dollars a year which comes to like a dollar a week you know and but it's weird because that one dollar a week keeps really keeps trolling from happening um, so the only people who are in that community are people who have chosen to be into that in that community and so that you can be so much more vulnerable there mm -hmm. and um and i decided in in September that I wanted to start a newsletter on Substack called Letters from Love, where I teach people how to write themselves letters from unconditional love. And, and it's just, you know, it, it grew out of the first story that I told when I talked about the origin of it was when the Dalai Lama first came to the United States, um, I think in the seventies or eighties, and nobody knew who he was. He, some people in California, of course, were the first Americans to have invited him. And, and Sharon Salzberg, the great meditation teacher was in the room and he had never been to North America before. And very few people knew who he was. And somebody asked him, it was all these spiritual leaders and philosophers in the room. And somebody asked him what his opinion was on self-hatred and what his guidance was on the problem of self-hatred. What do you do about self-loathing and self-hatred? And he had to speak for 20 minutes with an interpreter to even understand the question because he kept thinking he was misunderstanding the question because he kept saying, who is the person who is your enemy? Who is the person that you're struggling with? Who is the person that you're hating? And every Westerner and North American in the room was like, me, I'm the person that I hate. I'm the person that I struggle with. And he was like, wait, but that doesn't even make sense because you are your own self who is like nothing should be dearer to you than than this one who you are like that is the dearest thing it's like your your own soul and your own spirit you're telling me that you hate it or in the, or that it hates you mm. and that you're at a war with it and everyone's like yeah <laughs> like you've never heard of this <laughs> and he's like i've never heard of this and he said and sharon salzberg quotes him saying wow, this is very concerning 
to me because I thought I really understood the human mind, but I must confess that this is very strange. And But it's not strange to us because in Western culture, we're essentially taught to hate ourselves. Everything is, we never have enough of anything. We're never good enough. And anything that looks like self-kindness is accused of being egotism. And there's just no template for learning how to just, not even self-love, just self-friendliness, just essentially like being in friendship with this being who you are. And, and I've struggled for so many years of self-hatred and self-loathing and shame. I never thought I would have a shame-free day because it's a shame-based society. Mm -hmm. I think I grew up in a shame-based family and a shame-based culture. Mm -hmm. And so of course I'm drenched with shame. Mm -hmm. And so this exercise of writing yourself a letter every day from unconditional love is the antidote that I've found to retraining my mind to away from shame and toward friendliness. And just to show how much we all need this, I've only been doing this, this Substack thing for since September, and there's 60,000 people on it now, Amazing. like writing themselves love letters every day. It's so beautiful. And then sharing their letters and then talking to each other about their letters. And it's, it's just really precious. I thought you were going to go with the Dalai Lama towards, you know, Western culture is very individualistic. And so therefore the ego that that's why there would be more of a collective ego versus individualistic or more of a non-dual i'm i'm seeing through the illusion of a separate self but just to hear that it was the to not just hold yourself with preciousness and kindness like imagine a world from that and even this morning i read letters from love your your th this offering that you're doing and i read about doom and you were mentioning how the things that we're scared about never actually or hardly ever happen. Some hard things happen, but they're not from this energy of doom, right? It's not like the worst case scenario. So to even bring love to the parts of us that have used fear as a survival safety strategy is this higher way is to express and allow the fear to be there, but then to meet it with love and compassion. That's what transforms it within us. And then in our lives, our creativity, our business, our families. So I love this practice to come back to the heart, to come back to meet all of it with love. And it's, it's you, you write your insights and bring along other favorite humans of yours or humans that you meet along the way. It's, it's really a beautiful offering. And you had mentioned uh, how you mentioned this dialogue that's two way with God. How do you experience this two way dialogue with God? Well, it's funny because I've been writing myself letters from unconditional love for almost a quarter of a century. And then when I came into um, 12 step recovery, so much of 12 step recovery is about, I mean, it's really the only way to get well in, in addiction is to develop a conscious contact with a power greater than oneself mm -hmm. and a constant conscious contact, you know, like a, it's not just a daily moment of prayer. It's like a never ending, like I'm, I don't do well as soon as I lose contact, right? Yeah. Because then I'm up in my own brain. Yeah. And, and so then I discovered that there's this practice that um, Bill W., who was one of the original co-founders of, of AA, um, it, the first group of addicts and alcoholics who he worked with, the first 100, they all did this thing called two-way prayer, which was, I mean, a lot of us were taught how to pray, which I think of as the way I was taught how to pray, was I petition God, I petition a divinity, I express my fear and longing, um, and I, which is essentially just me talking. You know, it's me talking. Mm -hmm. Two-way prayer is me listening mm -hmm. um, because I was never taught how to listen for God. I was only taught how to talk to God, you know, tell God your problems, ask God for help. And two-way prayer is this incredibly simple and very beautiful practice by which you, um, the way you start it, if it's, if you're new to it, is that you find a quiet moment and you read something. They suggest that you read something that feels like divinity to you. So for me, that's like a Mary Oliver poem mm -hmm. or a Hafiz or a Rumi poem or a Walt Whitman poem. Mm -hmm. To me, those feel like the Psalms, you know, for other people, it could be the Psalms. It could be actual divine writing, but you read something that feels like this is a download of divinity. And and then I always think of it as like you're drafting in on that person's like, I feel like Mary Oliver was downloading divinity. And then when she died, she left the door open and you can just follow her right in there on her on her draft. Right. So like once that space is open in you, you just open a notebook and you write 
dear God, what would you have me know today? Mm. And it's the same question that I teach people on the, the letters from love newsletter there. It's dear love. What would you have me know today? Mm. But it's so interesting how subtly we can tune the radio of our consciousness. God is a different voice for me than love. Mm -hmm. Um, They're different. And, and I can feel the difference. If I ask love, what I get is unconditional love. If I ask God, what I get is unconditional love and guidance um, and direction because love doesn't direct me. Like your letter that you just read from unconditional love gives you no direction, asks nothing of you, demands nothing of you, doesn't need you to be anything, doesn't need you to do anything. Mm-hmm. Love is like, you're perfect. You could just like mm-hmm. live under a bridge in a cardboard box, wearing a garbage bag and spitting at people. And I love you. Mm-hmm. Like nothing is required. <laughs> like it's just this beautiful mature, what I think of as like the idealized maternal love. Yeah. But when I ask God for direction, I'm given direction. Like God will often instruct me in two way prayer to do things that I don't want to do, mm. you know? Um, and I'm like, God, God has things for me to do here. You know, love doesn't like love doesn't mm-hmm. have any agenda. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like love's mm-hmm. just like, you're perfect. I love you. And sometimes <laughs> I need that. And I think I needed the 25 years of practice of writing to myself for unconditional love before I was ready mm. for the ocean of God, you know, for the ocean of God. That's like, okay, you've been, you know, you're loved now <laughs> <laughs> and you know, you're unconditional, you're unconditionally loved. And this thing you've been doing is a little bit of bullshit yeah. and I need you to stop. <laughs> you know, or I need you to be a little less selfish, you know, like, I mean, that's the level that I feel like that I'm at with God right now is like, that's enough self-absorption. I need you to, I need you to be in service and I need, here are the people who I need you to serve today. And this is the the action that I need you to be taking because, um, the second half of your life, I need you in service. And, and that's why I'm writing this book about addiction that I don't want to write because, and it's not really about anymore what I want. I spent a lot of my life trying to get what I wanted and it often led to great tears. There's a lovely line that St. Teresa said that there are more tears shed over answered prayers than unanswered ones. Mm-hmm. And, and that's another reason why I don't really pray anymore asking for what I want because mm-hmm. I've gotten what I wanted. And it's Mm -hmm. almost killed me at times getting what I wanted, getting who I wanted, getting what I wanted. So now I'm just like, okay, God, what do you want? (laughs) (laughs) What you want is probably going to be better for me than what I want. And it's certainly going to be better for others because it includes what's best for all. And so it's a harder, it's a little bit of a harder conversation. Sometimes Mm -hmm. I hear things are harder to hear, Mm -hmm. Um, but I can always go to unconditional love if I need unconditional love. So it's all these different tuning signals that, I mean, I think we're all mystics and we're all shamans and we can all tune into these different channels of of being Mm -hmm. and receiving what we need to hear. Mm -hmm. And I hear love as the foundation kind of opened you to be able, and having that practice, but also having that tuning fork of reading something that opens you so that you could channel the divine and really hear the guidance sometimes fierce grace or that that guidance can be i love yeah. that i want to i want to i want to play with that thank you for sharing that practice yeah. do you have a a practice for writing like when you get into if you get into resistance or blocks to come back to inspiration or like do you write every day or do you write when you feel inspired what is your practice with that I don't write every day. I don't even write every year. Um, there are long periods of time that I go without writing. Mm. But when I'm on a project, because I take long breaks between projects, but when I'm on a project, um, I would say that my greatest tip is not so much about volume, but about time. Mm. So for instance, the resistance that I'm in right now in this memoir that I'm writing, the the solution to that resistance is I set a timer for an hour. And, and the only law is that I have to sit in front of that manuscript for an hour and I'm not allowed to look at the internet and I'm not allowed to get up and I'm not allowed to do anything else. I just have to be present to put my body. A lot of times I hear God say to me, just put yourself in front of the laptop. And like, you know, it's almost like I used to have the same thing. I, I lived over a gym once and it was just a rule that I had to be in the gym for 45 minutes a day. I didn't have to do anything. Mm-hmm. I just had to put my body in the gym. <laughs> <laughs> you know, 
I could sit on like a rowing machine and like read a magazine and not move, but it's like, you're going to sit on the rowing machine in the gym and read a magazine and not move. And eventually I'd be like, all right, I'll go to a recumbent <laughs> bike and I'll move a little bit, you know? So like with the writing, it's the same thing. It's like, I have to put my, the best to give myself the best possible chance to write. And the best possible chance for me to write is to do it first thing in the morning. I tend to wake up really early. I mean, I'm here with all these friends in Costa Rica. And even when I was with you, I was setting my alarm Mm-hmm. for five o'clock in the morning and I was writing for an hour or 90 minutes a day. But then I was able to be really present to everybody else for the rest of the day because mm-hmm. I was done with that work. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't have to be good. Um, I don't have to enjoy it. I just have to be there for a certain amount of time a day. And somehow that gets books written. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't understand Lore's not ceilings. how it works. Mm-hmm. It's like, here's another paragraph. It's like, here's another brick. Here's another sentence. I don't know how that got done, but somehow it got done. And then you know, one day you look up and it's, you got another one. <laughs> yeah, totally. 11 almost. Yeah. You, I, in doing research for this, I, I came across something that you shared in an interview that I imagine is connected to this. And it really resonated with me where you were speaking of finishing creative projects and had shared what's going to help you finish is not self-discipline, but self-forgiveness. Can you share with us a little about that? Yes. Thank you for reminding me of that because I need that right now myself. (laughs) Thank you. Um, And if you hear weird noises, everybody, it's howler monkeys. Um, It's evening and the howler monkeys are starting up here and outside this Airbnb here in Costa Rica. (laughs) It's not people murdering each other. (laughs) Um, So yeah, discipline is a word that can frighten a lot of people because I think a lot of people, one thing I notice is a lot of people say that they're not disciplined and they say it. I remember Ram Das one time saying to somebody, somebody said something like, well, you know, I can never finish anything. And Ram Das said, and I've borrowed this many times with people, Ram Das said, that's a stance you're taking. Mm-hmm. Like what you just said, that is a stance that you are taking. So congratulations, you're taking a stand in defending this this uh, idea about yourself that you never finish anything. Are you willing to drop the stance? Mm-hmm. And that can be anything. I'm bad at relationships. You know, like mm-hmm. I have a sponsee who always says like, I, you know, I'm just bad at human relationships. I'm like, that's a stance you're taking. Yeah. That's a stance. That's a closed mind. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, I'm done. I've, I've discovered this about myself. It does not change. I'm, I'm closed. So, so one thing about discipline is that I think it frightens people because they, it seems very militaristic and, And what I've noticed is that like my experience with creativity is that everybody starts on day one with, I think the most important day is day three. So, so day one is the day you begin your big project and everyone starts with the same excitement. You've got this wave of information of like inspiration and you're like, this is going to be so great. I'm going to do this amazing thing. It's going to be so cool. And then day two you look at what you created on day one and you want to put like cigarettes out in your eyes because you're like this sucks. (laughs) sucks. <laughs> I'm not very good at this thing that I want to create. And then you go into shame. What's going to get you back on day three to continue the project is not discipline because all the discipline in the world doesn't overcome shame. It's it's self-forgiveness. It's like the compassion to be like, oh, well, it's the cosmic shrug to be like, oh, well, I'm not good at this. Oh, well, no one's going to ever buy this. This is a big waste of my time okay, I'm just going to forgive myself for not being good at this thing. And I'm going to keep doing it. So mercy, I think is the word like mercy will get more creativity done than discipline. It's beautiful. But mercy is a discipline. I just realized that too, as I was saying that it's a practice. Mercy is a practice. That's right. I mean, I used to have such a fierce inner critic and that was a practice. We're not born with that. And it very much there's compassion for our family systems or the cultures that were because unconsciously the criticism can seem like it's trying to motivate us to do better, to protect us. And so once we get how it's trying to help us, maybe not efficiently, then we can have compassion for the critic and then, you know, come back to forgiveness and then ironically my experience is that change from the inside out is way more sustainable and it feels good that that compassion is productive. And so for anybody trying this out, you know, just maybe test it for one day. Like what happens when I can see it and I can have compassion for myself and still move forward? Maybe just for one day, we try that out as a society and do things a little bit differently. It's like, oh, that's the part of me that wants to make sure that I do it well. Um, 
is it helping? No, not that way, but I can take the feedback and I can upgrade the approach. And, you know, similarly, perfectionism comes up a lot for people around creative pursuits. And I think you said at one point that um, perfectionism is fear in disguise, so that it's it's like wearing a red mink coat and in stiletto heels. I'm curious about how you've navigated, um, if you've struggled with perfectionism and how you've kind of balanced having excellence with still letting it unfold. Is it doing it some of the inner work that you've been speaking about? That's such a good question. Yeah, because um, I do care. Yeah. And I want to make beautiful work. Um, and where is that line? I'm trying to find an answer in my mind to where is that line between this matters and this doesn't matter. Um, I think on the back of of my book, Big Magic, it says like, this is the great paradox of creativity. It's like, what you are creating does not matter. It literally does not matter. <laughs> and it's also the most important thing in the universe, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it, you know, you're, you're gifted and you're limited, mm -hmm. you know, um, you're, you know, it's important and it's not important. Yeah. And, and I feel like there's this, there's this, I always feel like I'm in God space when I'm in paradox, because I feel like God is paradox. Like whenever I'm in paradox, I'm like, oh, there's God. Cause it's gotta be, because mm -hmm. only God would be big enough to be able to contain like the All paradox of, of, yeah, I'm a spiritual being and I'm a, scoundrel and you know and like humans are beautiful and they're monsters and mm -hmm. this is a dream and we're just dreaming it and it's extremely important that you dream it like well mm -hmm. and then like everything is forgivable but don't fuck up again you know like all you know <laughs> stuff like there so so i think you know i've 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 described myself as a diligent half ass um like a a really disciplined half ass uh -huh. work really hard but I don't aim for perfection. Okay. And I think that I'm very lucky that that is my, that that is the way that my brain works because most artists I know are the opposite. They're perf they're lazy perfectionists. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I think perfectionism does bring laziness. I mean, it doesn't bring lazy is a very pro paralyzing term. It, it paralyzes. paralyzes. Mm -hmm. I mean, perfectionism is paralyzing. It can look like laziness because yeah. you you never begin because you already know that it's never going to be good enough. You're frozen. And like yeah. I'm very willing to be to be a half ass. Um, and I'm a really sloppy writer. Um, I don't do a lot of editing while I'm going. I need a ton of eyes to edit my books when I'm done because the amount of typos, the amount of like, I don't really understand grammar. I still don't really understand mm -hmm. grammar. I still don't know where the punctuation marks go on either side of parentheses. I still don't know whether you lay on the bed or lie on the bed. I don't, there's so <laughs> much like, I don't really speak English that well. <laughs> My Spanish is really hard for me. <laughs> I, 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 you know, like, this is where I always get stuck learning second and third languages too, because yeah. it's like, I don't, really speak English that well, you know, but what I am good at is I'm a good storyteller. Yeah. I'm in service to telling good stories. And so I can feel as I'm writing, whether the story is being told well, mm. it doesn't have to be told perfectly. It just has to be told well enough. Mm. Um, and I think a really good a tip that I can also offer is I write every one of my books for and to somebody, um, specifically a person, a single person. And lots of times when people are working on, I'll just speak to, to writing books, but when people are working on a book, I ask them who it's for, who are they writing it for? And they answer with a demographic. Mm -hmm. And they say, I'm, I'm writing it for women who have been through divorce. I'm writing it through people who have been through domestic violence. I'm writing it for people who are recovering for addiction. I'm writing it for young girls with eating disorders. And that's not a person. That's mm -hmm. not a human being. That's a voting block. That's a demographic. Mm -hmm. And if you write to a demographic, your work will sound like it's a pamphlet, um, that it's an, inf an informative brochure. And that is not what we want our work to sound like. And so my really big trick is with each one of my books, I choose one person and I write the book to that person as if it were a letter that they alone will read. So I wrote um, E Pray Love to my friend Darcy Steinke, who's an amazing novelist. And every word of it, it was basically a letter to her about my trip, about what I did that year. Mm -hmm. So when people say to me, I feel like your work is really intimate and I feel like you're talking to me. And talking to a friend talking. because everybody yeah but even you know when i read e pray love i told you it was like a decadent chocolate cake i just i don't 
you know, just like you, language is not my thing. And I couldn't put it down. It was the one kind of nonfic, like, or I only read self help books. And this was not really that. It was like that in disguise. It was just such a good uh-huh. thing. It inspired so many people. But it's like you're writing to your girlfriend, a friend that is just so close to you. That's why you can feel your heart. And everybody knows and loves you because of that. I'm all, and I'm also curious what it was like to have Julia Roberts play you in your movie. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's still surreal. Right. Like that, to answer that last question first, like it's yeah. still surreal. It's such a funny thing. I always think of the first time I saw you pray love, it was in a, they, they, the, the, the producers had like rented out an entire movie theater in New York in the middle of the day to just show it to me like by myself. So I like, actually I was with my husband, like we sat, the two of us were alone in this movie theater watching this thing that we were both in, you know, and, and, and it was so wild like in the very first moment of the film this julia roberts like walking through the jungle of bali and she goes to cutulier the medicine man and she says she smiles that like radiant julia roberts smile and she says hi i'm liz gilbert i'm a journalist from new york and i was like no you're not you're julia roberts like that's crazy like no one's gonna believe this like nobody's gonna believe is your Julia Roberts? Your wow. Julia Roberts. No one's gonna. It was just so so crazy and surreal, but she did such a beautiful job with it, and they you made did. such a gorgeous film. And you wrote so it just. I love your writing. It's it's captivating, and I hear that when you're. It sounds like by writing it to someone, it helps us feel more intimate with you. And so I love that feedback. And I also love that you just don't edit as you go so that you're focused on the storytelling and less, cause I think there's right, you've got the right brain and left brain, the creative and the logistic. And so really staying in the creative helps you probably with some of that flow. I don't let myself go back and edit very little. I mean, I'll, a little bit, sometimes I'll go back maybe like half a chapter to just make sure that it's sort of flowing. But the first draft is really, um, it's like my friend Martha Beck said one time, she was like, watching you write a book is like watching somebody swim the English channel in one breath. (laughs) She's like, you, you know, you just go like, (gasps) and you just go in and you just don't come up till you're on the last page. And that's like how, that's the only way I know how to write. Because if I do come up for air, meaning if I come out of creative space and into logistic analytical space, it, I'll stop. Yeah. You know, I'll stop because it's like, there's too many analytical reasons to stop. Mm-hmm. There's no analytical reason to continue creating. There's none. Mm-hmm. My, my quick analytical, like rational brain can make no sense of this thing that I do. It yeah. just is like, I don't even understand why you're doing this. <laughs> this doesn't make any sense. And I'm like, I don't understand either. God told me to do it. I don't know. I'm just here to serve. I have no idea. <laughs> That's beautiful. And, and I imagine that if, especially for creatives and artists, imposter syndrome comes up a lot in creative endeavors. Um, what would you, what advice would you have for them? I, I wonder if that comes up more when you're when you're in your analytical brain, kind of reflecting on it versus just being in the creative flow. But, you know, I think yeah. people face inadequacy, especially yeah. when they're having success too, where it's like, wait, for me, I don't know if you've had any um, n- nuggets of wisdom around that. Well, I mean, the experience, the lived experience that I had was that I was really fortunate that it took me so long to become successful as a writer. And I don't define that as my fourth book, which was Eat, Pray, Love. And it's wild, like still can't even process its success because it's like so out of the realm. Like that is just so bananas. Like Thank when you, people by the way, started, for writing that, truly. I know welcome. I told you when we were ro- rolling around in the waves, <laughs> but it genuinely opened so many people, especially women traveling, doing their kind of pilgrimage in the world. I told you I did my own Eat, Pray, Love journey after reading your book. I went to India. I went to Thailand, Bali, and then I was going to go to Australia, but I loved Bali so much. I just canceled everything and stayed. But that was one of the most powerful trips and times of my life inspired by your journey. And I know I speak for so many people because of that book. It was more than a book and it was more than your story. You were, you gave voice and guidance for others to have a spiritual, uh, journey of of awakening of finding themselves of reinvention so i just again just wanted to say thank you it's so decadent so good oh you're so welcome dear and i think i said this to you when we were flopping about in the waves that when you said you went on your own eat pray love 
journey, it's one of my favorite things to hear people say, like, and, um, and I said to you, it's not like women had never traveled before you pray love. And it's not like women had never traveled alone before you pray love. And it's not like women had never gotten divorced before you pray love and gone on soul searching journeys for themselves. We just didn't have a name for it. You know, yeah. like, and that I think is like my favorite idea of like, if I have a legacy at all that, oh, I'm the one who came up with the name for that thing. <laughs> so that now, like across the globe, a woman can say to somebody, I'm going on my, I'm on my eat, pray, love journey right now. And everybody knows what she's talking about. Mm -hmm. It's like this shorthand for like, yeah, I'm, I like quit my job, sold all my stuff, left my relationship. And I'm out here looking for the world and for my place within it. And that's yeah. called eat, pray, love. Yes. And um, so I just feel like that's like a really beautiful thing. But, but I had seven years of rejection letters before I ever got anything published, a short story published in Esquire magazine, like what, 30 years ago now. Um, and I, you know, I got really good at getting rejected. I got really good at, at just lowering expectations. And the only aspiration I had was that I, I mean, this is honest. I just wanted to have something published before I was dead mm -hmm. and people in my family live a long time. So I was like, I got a long time. I'm going to wear <laughs> these people down. I'm going to wear these people. I'm only 22. I'm going to wear that. Like I'm here for another 80 years. Eventually somebody's going <laughs> to cave something that I've written. And, um, and I had three books before you pray love that, that sold very few copies and that I loved, I loved those books. And, and I thought that must be interesting books. too. Cause if you love something and the world doesn't receive it the same way, I mean, that's its own yeah. journey in of, it, in of itself. Yeah. Yeah. But I like it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's the thing. It's like, this is the great sort of casual, this is the half ass part of me. This is where like, for some reason, my perfectionism doesn't penetrate this general sense I have, which is like, I've always liked my work. Like yeah. I, even when I was a little kid and I used to write stories, I was like, that's good. That's I amazing. Like that. You know, and no one's ever allowed to say that, but like, I always, I'm always the biggest fan of my own writing. I love my writing and, and I enjoy it. I think it's good and I like it and I want to share it with people because I like it. And, um, and I, I think, think it's a wonderful thing. I think it's, I'm sorry to, sorry to interrupt you. I think it's important that you are a model for that because I think some people think it's conceited or I should be more humble or something, but really by you loving what you do and sharing that it normalizes that you can love your own work. Like that's, that's beautiful. Yeah. I, I don't think it's conceited because I don't think I made it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think the reason that I love it is because I'm like, Oh my God, look at that. Mm. You know, it's like the way a parent must feel about their kid. It's like, mm. How did this beautiful thing come out of me? Yeah. You know, like that is so cool. I don't think it's like I was talking to a friend of mine who's got kids the other day, and I'm like, I love when I hear you brag about your kids because it's like it's coming from this place of wonder. It's coming from this place mm -hmm. of like, can you believe that like I squeezed out of my body a kid who can play the piano? Like, and I can't, like, that's how I feel about my books. Mm -hmm. I'm like, how did that? Um, out of this thing, you know, so I think that that's the sort of delight in it, yeah. you know, like, if I thought I was the one generating it, I would be a lot more frightened, mm -hmm. and I would be a lot more insecure. And I would be, I'd have just a lot more tangled up in it. So, yeah. and so then after Eat, Pray, Love, when I wrote Committed, the book that followed up, which is literally the sequel to Eat, Pray, Love, I estimated one time that I think it's sold. I mean, everyone who read Eat, Pray, Love back then was like, write another book, write another book. I'm like, okay, first of all, I've already written three. You're welcome to go back and read any of those at any time. And people are like, no, 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 we're not interested in those. You know, and I'm like, cool, cool, cool. And so then I'm like, okay, I'll write a sequel. So I write the sequel and it's sold. I would think, I think I did the math one time, like one ten thousandth numbers of the cups. Like for every one copy of Committed that sold 10,000 copies of Eat, Pray, Love sold. So so it it did 10,000 times worse. <laughs> <laughs> That's one way to look at it. <laughs> right? Yeah. Like the sequel to the book did 10,000 times worse. And like, people will still come up to me and be like, are you ever going to write another book after Eat, Pray, Love? And I'm like, once again, <laughs> I've written multiple books, including a sequel to that very book. And then you see their eyes glaze over because they're like, yeah, but I don't want that. I want to just have the experience again of reading Eat, Pray, Love for the first time. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah, but I can't help you with that. Mm -hmm. Like I do have these other books, but, but I also don't, I don't, nobody's in trouble for that because they're not required to want to read it. Like yeah. they're not required 
Nobody's required to go on any of the journeys that I go on with me. I am required to go on those journeys, but you're not required to join me. So if you want to come, you can come. If you don't want to come, that's okay. But if I was somebody who was super attached to the outcome mm -hmm. of my work, I would have, it would have been catastrophic despair writing mm -hmm. the book that came after Eat, Pray, Love. Doing a book, if I was a, a, a Fortune 500 company and my second, my second quarter had a 10,000% <laughs> drop in sales, like I would have to be, like the whole board would have to be fired. We have to declare bankruptcy, you know, but it's just like, I was just like, wow, that's really interesting. People didn't like that one. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I liked it though. I still like it. I think it's a really nice book, um, but I'm just going to go make another one. Yeah. You know? I hear a few things and how you're holding it inside of yourself that I think is really helpful to highlight. One is I hear that you are not what you do. There's a separation with it and that you're being used to channel and share a project that's like a baby. It's a creative baby. So that helps you maybe pivot or stay true to your own voice of what you want to write, not just get caught up in what other people want, which is also, I think, hard for creative because I think there's some lines of wanting people to like it, but then also staying true to what you want to sh say and share. But I also hear high involvement, low attachment, like being all in and letting go. Ooh, I love that. High involvement, low attachment. Mm -hmm. That's like Did the internal... No, I, the, I heard it from the University of Santa Monica. I call it surrendered action. So it's like being totally surrendered inside, but in action and consistent behaviorally. So internally surrendered, externally in action. I'm writing this down right now. My <laughs> involvement low attachment is is everything. Yeah, it's good. Uh, it's like that's that's, and but I hear you're living that, and I think that's that's how you stay consistent where you keep honoring whatever wants to come through and you're letting go of how it, yeah, your, your identity around it or how it needs to come through. You're just surrendered in the process. I mean, if you could do relationships that way, think of it, yes. you know, like fully in That's right. and holding it so loosely. Yeah. I it's tell Emilio. It's like, I'm completely present and available to this life. Oh, I have a terminal diagnosis and I've got a month to live. Low attachment, mm -hmm. high involvement. Mm -hmm. Like that's incredible. Yeah. Like, wow, what a liberating and vibrant way to live. Thank yeah. you for that. Yeah. Today. Yeah. It's medicine. And I think it applies to every, every area of our lives, relationships included. Also, wow. it's like when we do, because I know a lot of your work marries spirituality and creativity, which I also want to talk about. Um, but when you when you really know what you are on a deep level, when you are sourced, I call it insourcing, when we can source our own safety, our own okayness and be with these parts, it's easier than to navigate the things that the disappointments are quote unquote, that we want it to go a certain way. And, and as we feel connected, so even in relationship, when I feel connected to the love that I think somebody else gave me, which really they're a projection and a mirror for the love that I experience with them, they didn't give it to me and they couldn't take it away yes, I still choose to be with my husband and I want to play with him. And I can source that love regardless. I am that mm -hmm. love. And mm -hmm. I feel like I know that deeply with relationships and I'm combing through my knowing through work and uh, my own creative endeavor. So I like how clear it is inside of you and I appreciate. I'm the opposite. Yeah. I, 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 I <laughs> exactly. <the opposite. laughs> Great. We have good I medicine have, for each other. <laughs> I know. Well, for some reason, the creative part just makes a lot of, it's always been very straightforward to me that that's how you do it. And it's been easy for me to do it. It's like full investment, no attachment that's relationships. Cool. I'm like full, att full attachment, not necessarily even very much investment. You know, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like I'm, I don't know if I really want to pour myself into this, but I'm extremely attached to the outcome. So yeah, this is yeah. really interesting. Yeah. So yeah, we get places where different aspects of life are easier and harder for different people. So it's why, it's why we need so many of us. That's right. We've got no medicine of us for each other. Answer. Yeah. Exactly. And life, I always say is the real coach, like life will present us with people and opportunities to help us grow and evolve. And so as we just keep looking and being with what's next, I think we have a, a relationship that keeps us humble and keeps us connected to, okay, what's actually true and what feels like the next most intelligent step to keep seeing through, oh, that attachment or what's, you know, just coming back to the heart, which is a big part of what you've been sharing here. Um, so in terms of your 
uh, your, your, the project that you're currently working on, is there anything, any inspiration that you want to share about that or anything that's coming forward for you? Oh gosh. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, um, I swore I would never write another memoir, mm. but, but then life keeps being interesting, you know, and, and oftentimes though, I mean, just from a pure storyteller's standpoint, the most interesting things that I've ever experienced have also been the worst, you know, like at the time of the living of them, it was the worst, but then it, but then it just, it was also really interesting. Um, like, and I always think of interesting as like a good antidote to the word awful, you know, <laughs> it's like, Oh, God, it was so awful. And, but it's just, a, it's just like, yeah, but it's also really interesting. Like, um, and my experience of, falling so deeply in love with somebody over many years who was my best friend and mm -hmm. then slowly realizing that, Oh, wow, this is my person. Like this is, this is the, this person has my heart. This is the love of my life and the person I trust the most in the entire world. Mm -hmm. And then having that person return to active drug addiction and become the most dangerous person I have ever been around. Mm -hmm. So like to have the rug ripped so hard out from under me, which is an experience of life that I don't know anybody who hasn't had at some point. It seems to be part of, not maybe those specifics, but it seems to be part of the contract of, of like your curriculum here on, in earth school that you will have the rug ripped out from mm -hmm. under you. Mm -hmm. um, you will not be able to make it through earth school without being betrayed abandoned, lied to, violated, abused, harmed, um, manipulated, like, and very likely to also do those things, mm -hmm. you know, at certain points in your life to be the one who is harmful, who is manipulative, who is like, we're all taking turns playing these roles with each other. And it's interesting, you know, like apart from being tragic and devastating, it's also just like, wow, I didn't, this is really interesting. I didn't know my story was going to go this way. Mm -hmm. I think that it, after, I always joke that after the age of 40, certainly after the age of 30, but like, or 30 or 40, like I think every woman I know could write a memoir with the title, not exactly what I planned, you know, <laughs> <laughs> in terms of their life, like yeah. not exactly what I planned, you know? I'm and so yeah, I, you know, I really thought I had my life pretty sorted by the end of Eat, Pray, Love. And so did everybody about my life. They were like, well, she solved it, you know, like, like tidily done, like neatly, like she figured it all out, you know? And I was like, yep, I'm done. And then life was like, oh no, we're not done. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so I'm showing up, I showed up for the experience and now I'm showing up for the reflections upon the experience, which mm -hmm. I think is a lot of what creativity is, is just reflecting back what life brought you you yeah. know and um, and uh, and I'll Stephen Mitchell actually Katie's Katie's wonderful husband has this great line about what the, what he learned in 30 years of Zen study and practice he said first they rip the rug out from under your feet then they rip the floor out from underneath the rug then they rip the ground out from underneath the floor now you're ready to begin Ooh. now you're ready to begin and these like terrible experiences we go through where we're like it's raining hammers everything's falling apart it's like here goes the rug here goes the floor here goes the ground and the difficult thing is we live so long now i think we go through so many cycles of that you yeah. know um i don't doubt that that's going to happen to me again i'm not i'm not super looking forward to it but i'm like as long as I'm here in earth school it seems to be that there will be more cycles of like oh shit i thought this was a I thought this was a parachute. <laughs> it turns out it's a it's a backpack filled with cinder blocks. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, like, oh my God, I thought this was solid ground and it's quicksand. Oh, I thought like I thought this was gonna be my miracle, but it's my nightmare. Like, whoa, it's so disorienting being in this video game. And yet here we are. Mm -hmm. And and it's interesting. Mm -hmm. You can't you can't deny it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. I, I, I love your willingness for all of it. I think your openness is what makes it the, the ride more graceful. And I, I just was curious, just in closing, if there's anything you want to share with people 
Um, if you had a message just in your heart, that's true and alive right now, just because you have so much magic and wisdom, Lizzie, it's just, I love that we get to bottle you up and your, and feel the, the draft of your opening and your essence through your books. And I'm so excited to read this new book that's going to come out. I know you're working on now. And I imagine that it also helps you reflect on the lessons and the learnings and to use life instead of being used by it to say there's a loving intelligence and what am I learning through this, right? It's okay Mm -hmm. to sometimes for all of us to feel like a victim. My husband and I will sometimes ham up the victim. I'll be like, you are the worst person, right? So it's just like to allow (laughs) all expressions, even the complaining, consciously complaining, whatever it is, to just allow them to reflect, to learn from it and keep learning and loving really essentially. But I I would love to hear just whatever is alive or true in your heart to share with people that some kind of, yeah, wisdom you want to share. You know, it's funny that this is coming up, but like something, there is an intelligence in creation that loves you so much. That is the one thing I truly believe to be true. That is, um, and it's so fond of you. You know, it's so fond of you and you don't have to earn its love and you can't lose its love. And, and it wants, it wants to talk to you. Um, and it wants to be heard by you. Everything, everything in us wants relationship and this thing that cannot be named or seen or proven. I very much believe that it just wants to love you. Um, and it just wants to know you and and it's very sympathetic to how hard this is and it's still really excited for you that you're here you know and it's like there's a there's a thing I learned in India at the ashram where I studied this ancient Vedic story is, is that like when babies are are conceived you know there's an agreement like I always think I do best in life when I believe that I chose to come when I don't believe that I'm randomly here, I believe that I chose to come. I believe that I chose this time to be born probably again. I believe that I chose this particular family, Mm -hmm. um, that I I chose that I I laid out this whole thing in collaboration with some great universal intelligence, like, okay, this is the ride we're going to take this time. And, um, and the way that they explain it in this, this very ancient Indian belief is that like, while you're in the womb, in your mother's womb, like around six months, five or six months, they show you essentially a video of what's going to happen because you choose it and then you're conceived and then you forget, you know, and then you're just like lolling about in the womb and you're just like, this is great. Like, it's, I love it here. It's warm. It's safe. All my needs are met. I've got plenty of food. It's comfortable. Like I, I must be in heaven. And then they're like, okay, so um, you forgot, but like you chose to be born again. And here's what you're, here's what's going to happen mm. like in your lifetime. And that's when babies start kicking. Cause they're like, no, <laughs> I have to be incarnated. I have to experience suffering. I have to experience separation. I'm going to have all this loss and all this shit. Like, and they're like, get me out of here. Like get me out of here. <laughs> too, late. Oh, that is too late. And it's like, no, you're going to have to do this. It's a nightmare. But they, but they suggest in the, in the, in the, the tradition that I studied, you're given your first mantra at that moment. Mm -hmm. And it's actually the sound of breath, the sound that breath makes, it's hum, sa. So it's like hum is the inhale, sa is the outhale, like hum, sa, hum, sa, hum, sa. And they give hum, sa to you and hum, sa translates from the Sanskrit as I am that. And it's the reminder that whatever else is going on, you are creation, you are divinity, you are that. And that's how you're gonna get through this crazy video game that you're about to enter, you know, and, <laughs> and it's just a reminder, don't forget you are loved. Don't forget you are of creation. You are not separate from anything. Mm. This is a very weird experience that you signed up for. It's going to be, <laughs> it's going to get a little crazier before it calms down. Again. <laughs> but buckle in, stay in your breath and you're going to get through it. So um, that's what I would say. <laughs> that's beautiful. Like literally being with you is it's like it's such a it's like a warm hug just reading your books being with you it just feels like I think I can speak for everyone that just feels like we've all known and love you forever and you come across with you're a breath of fresh air I am grateful for your existence for your friendship I know that my community is going to want to stay connected and in touch 
where's the best place for them to do that? I mean, I invite you to all come to the Letters from Love on it's Substack. Good. It's, it's the good. best. It's the it's the softest, kindest corner of the internet. It's like where all the really, really sweet, gentle beings come to mm-hmm. be together safely. It's like a really so. I welcome you all to join if you would like. Um, yeah. it's, it's a beautiful community. <laughs> so we'll we'll put um, links to that in the show notes here. That but where, do you have a website off the top of your head? Uh, elizabethgilbert.com okay. is me, but then I think it's, I think it's substack backslash Elizabeth. I don't know. If you just Google Elizabeth substack. Gilbert substack, you'll find it. Okay. Um, ask your, ask your neighbors. They know. Yeah. And invite your neighbors. <laughs> Let's all so drop into our hearts. It. Yeah. If it's your people, Alyssa, they're probably already on it. Yeah. They're like, probably we already on it. Diagram overlap of like who, <laughs> who we love. And us, so I'm sure. We'll drop into our hearts and just love on ourselves, love ourselves whole through community. Such an offering in the world. Thank you, Lizzie. I love you. Thank you for being You're here. Welcome. Goodbye from this Airbnb. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Thank you so much for doing this work that changes the world, starting with yourself. It truly does make a difference. And if you're finding value in this podcast, a cost-free way to support us is by leaving an up to five-star review. It does mean the world to us. And as a thank you gift, we're going to send you one of the most powerful tools that you will ever discover. You're going to get behind the scenes access, showing you how to live into your full potential without letting fear hold you back from stepping into your dreams. Just head over to Apple Podcast or Spotify and leave a review now. You can take a screenshot before hitting submit and then go to alissanobriga.com forward slash podcast to upload it. And make sure to have your automatic downloads turned on wherever you listen so you don't miss any of the upcoming episodes. I have so much magic I can't wait to share with you. And you can find all this information in the show notes below. But lastly, if you're on Instagram, I love connecting and hearing from you. So come on over and say hello. I'm at alissanobriga. Thank you again for being here. I cannot wait to share more with you.